This is a Rogue Media Network podcast. The Waco History Podcast is sponsored by Brotherwell Brewing on Historic Bridge Street in Waco. Cross the Brazos and Waco. Ride hard and I'll make it by dawn. Cross the Brazos and Waco. I'm safe when I reach San Antonio. Okay, welcome back to the Waco History Podcast. Uh, this is an this episode is an extension of an earlier uh, interview I did with Dr. Kenneth Haferty of uh, the Muse- uh, Museum Studies Department at Baylor University, a well published author. And one area of his publishing has been on uh, buildings in Waco, and so we had uh, historic homes of Waco, uh, and then he has recently published uh, historic buildings of Waco. And so we had a part one where we began to go through the book. So stop now <laughs> if you have not listened to part one and go back and do that. But Ken and I are going to pick up our conversation as we were kind of working through the book. Uh, I would encourage you to pick it up. It's a great book, great looking book, uh, whether you're interested in it for reference uh, or put it on your coffee table, whatever you want to use it for. It's Historic Buildings of Waco, Texas. Kenneth Haferty, and in the pipeline is more historic homes of Waco, Texas. That is correct. Right, yes. And so when, if folks are, are marking their calendars, when should they expect to hold that book? Well, all I know is what Mr. Amazon tells me. Okay. And, and, what, and what does he say? And Mr. Amazon says February 23rd. February 23rd. I don't know how he came up with that. But okay. But Mr. Amazon never lies. Okay. So, so just in time for uh, leap year. Uh, right. you'll be able to re- re- read Ken's uh, third book exactly. uh, on Waco. Yeah, and the buildings book actually came out a week before Mr. Amazon's estimated okay. date. So. All right, so it happens. That is an unpaid in- <laughs> endorsement of Amazon. <laughs> uh, okay, well, as we were working our way through, we had uh, you chose to organize the book uh, less by period and more by type of structure. And so we're, we're kind of working our way, although there is an organization within the chapters that, that <laughs> yeah. is periodized. Yeah, it just made sense to, to, to group it by building types mm-hmm. because once you do that, um, you are able to make more meaningful comparisons with other buildings of the same type. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, um, and, and then you can sort of see the evolution within um, you know, commercial buildings or manufacturing buildings or whatever. Well, that's a great setup because uh, we were talking about about start talking about chapter three wholesale and manufacturing. Uh, a lot of these buildings, folks are familiar with. Um, they're they're most of them have been repurposed in some way, but they are still a vibrant part of the uh, city landscape. Um, so I'm interested, uh, Ken. Just some some of these are very familiar buildings, but maybe some things you discovered in researching for this chapter that were less known to you. Well, it's interesting. The for one thing, to think about the the fact that so many of these buildings were right in the path of the tornado in mm-hmm. 1953. Um, thinking of the uh, what's now the Dr Pepper Museum, the Artesian Manufacturing and Bottling Company. On the, uh, the the Waco North side of the building, there's a, a change in brick, which reflects the gash that was created by the tornado in '53. And you know, if you move from there to uh, the, uh, the the next one, it's the McClendon Hardware Company, which most of us know as River Square Center. So that we we could uh, put in some commercial placement for various restaurants that we like mm-hmm. and and all, but. The thing that's the striking about that was that it was severely damaged by the, the tornado, that the, the top floor of the building was uh, removed. And uh, in addition to that, most of the ornament that was on that uh, side. And when it was, was uh, adaptive, adapted to become the, the, the group of restaurants and shops that it has, um, it's interesting that it ended up being flipped to what had been the alley side of the complex Mm. uh, became the front of the complex. Um, Originally, the 
the the front of the building was actually on the the west side, which is now the side of a of a lovely Mexican restaurant. Yeah. So um, Mary, so Mary, yes, yeah, was once the right. Frontage, and yeah. well, and and Mary had the uh, railroad tracks, mm-hmm. which was so critical in in most of these buildings because they wanted deliveries of goods in, and if they're shipping to other locations. Um, and so that Mary was the secondary one, and I guess that's Third Street that was the the the, the pedestrian entrance, shall we say? And no one, uh, very few people remember, but but um, originally where the parking lot is for that complex now, it's act that was actually a block. It had a hotel on it and mm-hmm. other buildings, and so there was just a narrow alley that separated that from uh, McClendon, McClendon Hardware. So. Um, at by the time that, that this was adapted in 1995-97, uh, uh, I, I don't know if the, it's the entirety that had been cleared away, uh, mm-hmm. probably part of the urban renewal that had uh, happened in the 60s and, and early 70s. But um, they were able to create a whole new set of entrances and the sort of shady uh, 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 front porch of the building. So, you know, it's, it's very successful in terms of the way it was adapted, it doesn't give you much of a clue as far as what the building was originally like. Yeah. So. It, yeah, it does give a sense of, you know, even as you say that, I'm looking at the picture, uh, I think taken by Kenneth Haperty. I think that's in, a fair in, in the book, also the contributed all the images <laughs> on the book. You, you can kind of look at the back side of it on Mary and notice it's, it's a fairly ornate, backside of a building that does suggest the fact that the frontage that this was the frontage mm-hmm. uh, at one point on that building yeah you can actually flip between that and the previous one the dr pepper museum and there's a grand arch and that was the railroad entrance side I see. on mary as well uh-huh. so uh and the, the architect is the same milton w scott mm-hmm. and um the 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 way that it, it worked out in the, the adaptation, there's now fencing that hides the dumpsters and mm-hmm. <laughs> you know uh, coolers for alcoholic drinks and things like that, uh, which you got to do what you got to do. But it's dramatically different. That grand arch that you can see on the right side of that mm-hmm. photo uh, was really you know the architect's way of emphasizing the importance of that uh, that entrance into the building. Uh, in terms of all the goods that were coming in, yeah, because this was um, a basically retail and wholesale hardware company. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I do want to ask while I'm looking at the uh, Artesian Manufacturing Bottling sure. Company building, uh, and and you may or may not know the answer to this question, but obviously, uh, when folks talk about the tornado, they talk about the different colored brick. Was that a, an inability to find matching brick, or was that an intentional choice? I've heard both <laughs> uh, in choosing to come back with that different colored brick in the reconstruction. Yes, uh, d- it definitely is a different uh, color, and I'm not sure whether that was intentional okay. or whether it was, oh, what the heck, this this somewhat matches. I I. I like it in the sense that it does acknowledge the history of the Mm-hmm. The, the the building and what it's gone through and, you know, reminds us how amazing it's uh, renaissance and reuse as a museum actually is. Um, in the the uh, the research for the book, um, I was able to dig down enough to uh, find out that the the brick that was used on the building is actually from Elgin, uh, east of Austin, okay. which became... In just in the er, the first decade of the 20th century, became a, a, a brick making locale. Mm-hmm. So, uh, if this building had been built 10 years earlier, <laughs> it would have had a different looking okay. color brick because it was not commercially uh, available uh, at this point. So, it's interesting uh, finding out little details like that. Yeah. And the the building was also illustrated in a. a, a uh, an industry journal called the, I think it's like the sub- Southern Carbonator or something like that. Um, <laughs> I get that. I which get the Southern <laughs> Yes, I, I think yeah. I've noticed that uh, in the uh, outer office of the Texas of uh, the uh, uh, Institute for Oral History. <laughs> but um, the and the thing that 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 was striking about it is that it actually includes uh, 
Milton Scott's original plans hmm. for the layout of the first, second, and third floors. And hmm. so it's really interesting. Um, you know, a lot of original fabric is, is retained on the inside, but uh, in the way that it's been adapted over the years, you really don't get a sense of how it functioned as a building on, on the inside. And so the type of architectural historian that I am, I'm interested in what makes it a, a distinctive building, what makes it a beautiful building, but I also want to know what makes it work. So things like, you know, the secondary entrance on the Mary side and, mm -hmm. and you know, there, and there was actually, you know, uh, decking on that side so that the, 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 train, uh, the train cars could just uh, roll right up, uh, right up to it. But the, the pedestrian uh, entrance, when you came in from the Fifth Street side, uh, to immediate right, that th there was actually a corner office. It sounds like it's mm -hmm. going to be in a skyscraper or something, but it's actually the first floor of the Dr. Pepper Milling building was the president's office. Mm -hmm. So that corner office was was uh, uh, considered prestigious um, even then. Mm -hmm. And there was actually a large safe for all the uh, the, the, the the funds of the company yeah. uh, adjoining that space too. So it's interesting to, to me uh, trying to find out more about how it worked, also how it was put together, where did where did things come from, mm -hmm. and uh, so um, when you can get that level of detail, yeah. it it can be uh, more more interesting than simply dwelling on, you know, uh, what particular type of column is used or something like that. Mm -hmm. So th that uh, connective thread of adaptive reuse that we see in a lot of these buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, River Square Center, kind of the repurposing of that building, I really see that historically as the beginning of kind of the renaissance of, of downtown, it seemed. Would you agree mm -hmm. based on your research? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's it's fair to say that, that, uh, that there, there had been such a turning away from downtown, uh, downtown in the 60s and 70s and you know, driven by you know a lot of the government ideology of urban renewal, mm -hmm. and that that anything was was old was uh, expected to be slums or substandard or the like. And why don't we build something new? Mm -hmm. I think there was a sort of arrogance to that, and, and uh, uh, an unwillingness to to see the good that was in the past. So it was. A progressive movement, but uh, not one that was was uh, was willing to appreciate the appreciate the past. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm uh, I'm glad that that the that project came along, and it certainly has uh, led the way for a lot of important Waco uh, uh, shifting projects like the silos, <laughs> which is in this chapter as well. The old yes. Brazos Valley uh, cotton oil mill. Yeah, and I. It's interesting. I, I'd known about the cotton uh, oil mill. I did not know until I started doing research for this that it actually had been a sort of retail lumber location mm -hmm. in downtown Waco. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew that, that that area to the uh, southwest of the sort of central business district had a lot of things like, you know, the lumber yard for the Cameron Company yeah. and, and a, a lot of the other... Um, because again, right by the railroad. Right. Yeah, yeah that the same strategic uh, advantage that that you had there. So there's a weird weird sense in which uh, that original bu business was was lumber, but it was also prefab doors and windows mm -hmm. and all sorts of things for to to build your house, mm -hmm. which uh, seems to anticipate what happens in the the long run with uh, with uh, Magnolia yeah. coming in there as well. So. I'm I'm glad that they were able to save as as many of the uh, original buildings that they did, and of course this was something that was uh, done with some of the city's uh, tax increment fund monies. I think it's like a quarter of a million dollars, which now seems like quite a bargain to yeah. <laughs> yeah. to kick that in uh, into uh, to to see if we can jumpstart the Waco economy, which it certainly succeeded in in doing and because of that the public funding there it allowed the texas historical commission to come in and advise and so that was mm -hmm. an important aspect too that um you know the preservation historic preservation laws in texas tend to be fairly um light no no onerous burdens for uh property owners if at all possible 
Uh, but when there's public funding uh, involved in it, that does activate um, um, best practices, shall we say, mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of, of how you can respectfully deal with old buildings um, without, uh, you know, w without making it completely impractical for a modern business, as the case of, of Magnolia, uh, or the... Uh, 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 or, or completely transforming it. I mean, the biggest change in the, 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 the main structure that's now the Magnolia Market was that they painted the whole thing white. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was kind of a dreary concrete block. I mean, it was a workaday building. Yeah. And so just to be able to make that point, I think, is, is, is useful that, you know, sometimes these buildings were not intended to be something to look, to look at. And mm -hmm. so there's this way in which uh, what, what Magnolia and the Texas Historical Commission were able to work out is a good compromise. It sort of moves their brand forward, but it also is respectful of the footprint of the building and the material stayed the same. And, mm -hmm. um, it just it, it uh, works quite nicely. Yeah, and then they allowed the, the later built silos uh, to antique, if it were. Yes, that's that's kind of, I, I, uh, when, when that happened, um, I seem to recall that uh, that that there there was some concern on people's part that 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 the buildings uh, remaining unpainted uh, were going to uh, uh, rust away, and there there goes our, our our new symbol of Waco's prosperity in the early twentieth century. Um, it did strike me too that you know if if the city was willing to help pay for it, <laughs> you know that might be foolish to uh, not take the city up on that, um, but. Uh, as, as as far as I know, it, nothing uh, has been done that's that uh, or uh, nothing has been allowed to happen that's going to be irreversible, shall we say? Yeah. So yeah. we'll we'll just have to to keep our eye on that. So another building I want I want to get your uh, thoughts on. It's one of my favorite little buildings. It's tucked away on Ninth Street. Is the Texas Telephone Company Exchange yes. building, uh, which <laughs> has an incredible frontage i mean the facade of it is is really an anchor it's it's also a good demonstration of how you save money on the back <laughs> yes but uh, I'm, I'm interested in your research on that building what you discovered about it mm -hmm. um yeah i i agree with you that it is striking the shift from the fancy brick that's on the uh the the front four bays and then on the first bay to the rear, and I think it was designed with the anticipation that that rest, the rest of that block, that there would probably be an alley there, but, yeah. but that there was uh, not, I don't think they had any notion that there was going to be a parking lot there and that the whole darn side with the cheap brick was going to become uh, as prominent as uh, as it has. And yeah, this is an interesting, uh, I, I one of the things that I've enjoyed about the Waco project is it's taken me out of, I won't say my comfort zone, but the time period that I've tended yeah. to work on, which tends to be early Texas and early America, particularly the 19th century. And to actually be writing about things like early, early telephone exchanges yeah, yeah, yeah. is cool, or early gas stations or or automobile showrooms, which, you know, just completely inconceivable in Waco in the 1850s or 1860s. But to see to see his history roaring into the 20th century uh, was 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 quite interesting. So just in 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 terms of, of, of that building, it was really kind of striking that the um, the, the the way in which the building was uh, um, divided was actually divided by uh, gender. That the mm. uh, the second floor uh, of this three story building uh, had all of the the technology and the mechanicals, and that was the male floor. <laughs> and the, uh, above that, on the third floor, that was the operating room, which was the switchboards. Mm. So all of those photos that you see in Waco and elsewhere of all the young women sitting and connecting the the, the lines from, from one caller to another, this is where that was happening. And mm. I don't know that anyone really thinks about that anymore. Yeah. You know, you just drive by and it's, it's an old building. Um, but so it's interesting to, to know that and also that they, they actually uh, had a uh, small cafe 
on that floor mm. and a, a restroom, and that there was even a rooftop garden, which it seems like a pretty nice amenity for people who are working for the, the phone company. The interesting thing, too, is that in the, uh, the photo that I took for that, you can just see the yellow brick of the later uh, Southwestern Bell Telephone Building, which um, basically supplanted that building, but it was still part of the, 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 the telephone network. But that, that building from the 1950s, which is now owned by McLennan County, mm -hmm. uh, actually made it, uh, that was when the technology was first put into place to have uh, dial telephones. Okay. <laughs> so that you did not need to call the, uh, the operator and ask for somebody somebody else's extension or something something like that yeah um, and you know now that's become completely obsolete uh, in and of itself uh -huh. it's, it's its own period statement um, but just interesting to, to see the way in which the buildings and the addition additional buildings are related to um, uh, technological developments. Yeah, uh, very interesting. Yeah, now that's the McLennan County Archive. Right exactly. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, any other uh, wholesale and kind of manufacturing structures that you you want to highlight? Oh, there's uh, there's so we many. We can't we can't do all of them. <laughs> we can't do all of them. One yeah. one thing that that uh, strikes me, and you know, I don't know if I'm an old Wacoan. I'm old and live in Waco, but um, <laughs> you've been I, here a little. While. You've been here yeah, a minute. Yeah, been been yeah. here 23 years, yeah. uh, and you know I'm sure there are still people who consider me a newcomer. Um, but uh, everyone in Waco knows the uh, complex off of Lasalle Avenue mm -hmm. as being the LL Sam's uh, building, and I was completely startled to find when I started doing the the research on that 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 was originally a cotton mill. Yeah. It was like yeah. what um, that uh, and this was a, a building that was was first erected 1919 1920, and then in the immediate aftermath of World War II, it becomes adapted to become a manufacturing company for pews and pulpits and th and basically church furniture, mm -hmm. um, and now has been adapted once again uh, into uh, loft apartments for students at Baylor, and uh, on. The, the top of the tower, it actually still says Miller Miller Cotton Mill <laughs> on it. And, it, you know, it's, it's, it's white on white, so it's kind of hard to read. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, I wasn't sure how much I was going to have to say about that building. But then it turned out there was that. But there was also the, the fact that it was actually a design-build project for a guy from Fort Worth named uh, Wyatt C. Hedrick. And Hedrick about this time became a partner of Sanguinette and Stats, the, the, the skyscraper firm from mm -hmm. Fort Worth, who designed the Alico building and uh, a few other buildings here in, in Waco. And so it ended up becoming Sanguinette, Stats, and Hedrick. And he, he basically, they, they were looking to retire. And so he was the, uh, the heir apparent to the, the business. But he ended up um, uh, being an architect and builder in Fort Worth uh, was very involved in the construction of the Texas Tech University campus up mm. in Lubbock and uh, was actually pulled in to another project here in Waco, which is the Armstrong Browning Library. Oh. And, um, and that is a long story in and of itself. But they, um, Dr. Armstrong had been hoping to have uh, uh, architects from the East Coast. He had talked with John Russell Pope, a very prominent architect who had done the National Gallery of Art and the National Archives building. Um, but they needed to have someone who was a Texas architect to be sort of the name uh, on the project. So Wyatt C. Hedrick was, was brought in, and a lot of the exterior design of the building looks like his, but then uh, the, the inside actually uh, looks more like uh, buildings that you might see, you know, the National Gallery or something like mm -hmm. that. So finding those sort of interconnections of uh, uh, unlikely places of there is a connection between the the, the LL Sam's building and the Armstrong Browning Library. Yeah, pretty cr sounds pretty crazy. Yeah, to me. that's really interesting. Yeah, that, I, I know that Cotton Mill was an anchor for the Edgefield community yes. and neighborhood that was right out there. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, let's let's we can't give it all away because <laughs> you're asking folks. To pay I know. For it. Yeah. 
Run out and buy it, folks. Yeah, let's uh, let's jump to skyscrapers. Now we are sure, uh, sure. in our last episode because we, it is our home of Rogue Media Studios. <laughs> we kind of talked about the Alico building. What is the second tallest building in Waco? I don't know. Ken, come on. <laughs> Do you know the answer or? I, I don't think it's. I, I don't. I think it may be the Riggs. Uh, which that is, is to say, the Raleigh, the Riggins, the Riggins, the, Riggins, the, Raleigh, the, Raleigh. the, the whatever. Yeah, that's pretty tall. Yeah. And also the Liberty Bank building. Yeah, which the Roosevelt. They, yes. So those are the the three the three next ones. Yeah. And then actually the uh, the Medical Arts building I think may overtake them um, in 1927 29. Uh-huh. Um, I'm not going to sit here and count count uh, stories on. The, I did. The, <laughs> um, and the, the the medical arts building is interesting in that it it actually has some attempt at the sculptural interest of a lot of East Coast skyscrapers, mm-hmm. where there was a lot of concern that if you were just going to have simple up down buildings with a flat top, that you know that that was going to not. Uh, um, that it would um, throw too too much of a shadow, and that there just was not going to be enough interest if all of these buildings were repeating the same format. And you can see on the Medical Arts Building, which has more recently been the National Lloyd's Building, that it's actually set back on three of the mm-hmm. four sides, so that at the upper level there were these these fairly large balconies for uh, uh, the the people enjoying uh, a, a Waco evening to step. Uh, step out on and so uh it's it's been through uh uh some some unsympathetic changes over the years it's, it was one of the saddest examples of uh ripping out the original windows and putting in the blank reflective glass there which mm-hmm. just sort of gives it kind of a uh a dead-eyed look which actually is true as well of the liberty bank building mm-hmm. um there's something about the scale of those original uh, windows on any building really that gives it a lot of its character and you know I think I think that that for both of these buildings this sort of solid panes of glass is sort of what what renovators were doing in the age of urban renewal uh-huh. that um, well if we're not going to tear this down we might as well make it look modern and so the less it had to do with the original appearance the, the better, I think, is, is what they were really thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and a lot of this uh, construction, uh, of course, the, the Alico is the earliest, and a lot of this is the 20s. Yes. Where they're building these larger structures. Yeah, and I was actually, you know, just out of the nature of, of this project, there's one photo per building, unless there was a little extra space, and... Um, that that was sort of my way of disciplining disciplining myself, uh, you know, <laughs> not not having too darn many photos, uh, and and having uh, my editors at A and M Press scowl at me. But every now and then, there there are situations where if I had been able to tuck in one more photograph, the First National Bank Building, which uh-huh. is now owned by the Baylor University and uh, houses the School of Social Work, the um, the complex that you see right here, which is also Wyatt C. Hedrick again, uh, just about the same time he was working on Armstrong Browning Library. Mm. The original notion was that that what's the first National Bank building uh, was going to be part of a three-part building, which is going to have its tower in the center sort of uh, interrupting low level on both sides. It was actually oh. linked to the design of the Secretariat Building of the United Nations in Um, New York City. Okay. And, you know, I did my best to clearly describe that to the, to the the visitor, but one picture of the original drawing, which was in the papers at the time, and then seeing that the first national bank is the one fragment that was built. They, I guess they ran out of money and decided, well, we'll wait until next year or next decade. And by the time next year and next decade came around, it ended up becoming something completely different. The first national bank office building. Uh, designed by local architects. So um, it's hard to imagine that un- unless you've really seen that photo. Mm-hmm. So 
Yeah. One, of, one of these days. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think, you know, this is development that starts in the 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, historically, downtown's not doing very well by the time right. you get to the late 1950s. Yeah. yeah, and this was actually the 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 first National Bank building was the first to have a drive-in, uh, drive-in tellers. Uh -huh. it's a, and they're actually still extant on the back side of the building. <laughs> so if you're ever <laughs> on the Washington side and looking looking uh, towards it across another fine Waco parking lot. Um, you you can see that, and obviously they've not been used in in many many years, but it's it's intriguing to to find those sort of survivals from the building, and yeah. and also, you know, that was an indication of the way in which Americans were really becoming wedded to their automobiles mm -hmm. in the 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 fifties. Yeah. So uh, even even though you know there's, there's a sense that this is a, a bold statement, a vote for downtown at a time when people were saying run away, run away, um, it's um, it, it's still trying to accommodate to the the auto and mm -hmm. to other other types of modernity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. All right, well, let's let's jump to the public buildings chapter, and, and of course, there's a you use a, a loophole here to fit the <laughs> suspension bridge in there because you can't have a book without the suspension bridge. In yes, it. where do you put yeah. it if you don't <laughs> put it as a public building? This is something I know that you you were familiar with, but what did you discover in researching it this time? Well, the thing that that struck me about this that tends not to be in the five things that you hear about the building yeah. over and yeah. over and over again is the fact that it's really the creation of two completely separate building campaigns. Mm -hmm. And that I was very confused uh, um, walking over the bridge for many years uh, with my uh, dogs, Genevieve and Rascal. And they uh, and I noted that the, the steel frame on it was marked inland steel. And that always, uh, there was a cognitive dissonance to that for me mm -hmm. <laughs> in the sense that when was Inland, Inland Field Steel founded and how did that end up on this bridge? Mm -hmm. Well, it turned out that that was part of phase two. And that what we see there, the, the whole series of, of, of struts running across the bridge are actually from 1914. Mm -hmm. And that the the... Uh, sidewalks that are hanging out on each side from that are also from 1914. Mm. So it was a much simpler bridge in terms of numbers of lanes. And you know, basically in 1914, they're trying to <laughs> make it continue to be usable. Yeah. They, the only reason they were able to do that was that in 1910, they had just built the, the Washington uh, Avenue Bridge. Yeah. So that once Washington Avenue was open, okay, let's start start working on the suspension Which bridge. is the first automobile bridge. Yes. So they're retrofitting it in some ways right. for the automobile track. Yes. Yeah. And 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 at the the other thing that happened at the time that they were redesigning the bridge was that a lot of what architectural historians like to call the form-giving elements were removed from the original design, <laughs> uh, which is to say that you can see at the top of the two piers that frame the arches at each end, uh, it's a sort of simple cap that flares out at a couple of points. But on the original bridge, it really was a medieval revival look to it, which mm -hmm. had crenellation like you expected, you know, uh, men men in armor with their long bows uh, hopping up to shoot somebody or de defend a like. So that sort of medievalism, um, which was also incorporated in the fact that it was not plastered originally. Yeah. So that the the original bridge had its suspension suspension wires, but there was um, the um, the 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 feel of the brick, and it was very much a local brick. That was brick that was made by uh, William Barry Trice and his brother Cyan Trice and by John Wesley Mann. Mm -hmm. And that actually helped sort of build their fortunes in early Waco mm -hmm. and led to things like East Terrace, the, yeah. the, the, the building. But there was also, there, there was an architectural ideology uh, that, that goes back to England and John Ruskin and the notion of truth to materials and not hiding what you build with. Mm -hmm. And that you should make make buildings, that make the structure ornamental, not add ornament to the structure. Mm -hmm. So that was this Victorian notion of what makes a building uh, truthful. 
And so, and you, you can see in the photo in the book that the base underneath the bridge is still truthful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that you can see the uh, original uh, uh, Waco bricks. But above that, it ends up getting regularized through the plaster and through the caps that replace the, the battlements up at the top and the like. And there was even a middle point that in, in which the, the towers became billboards. And, you know, it was Bull Durham being advertised there and thing, things of that nature. Uh -huh. And I, I think once you went from the sort of medievalism to the commercialism, uh, probably by 1914, they thought the progressive thing to do is just plaster over it rather than, than, than try to take it back to some cleaner version of itself. Mm -hmm. So um, all of this, you know, made me more tolerant, I guess you'd say, mm -hmm. of what had to be done to uh, restore the building for the next century yeah. because things had to be done. And it's not the bridge that I used to walk over with Genevieve and Rascal. Um, but of course, even that bridge wasn't the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the, we were walking on planks of wood that, gee, they look very old. They look like they might be original. And it's like, well, yeah, they're original to 1914. But as you were saying, the, the, the attempt to make it safe for automotive traffic, that was actually a wood base, which was then paved over on top of that. So that wood had never been intended to be exposed yeah, yeah. in the first place. So, um, so in that regard, you know, the, the nostalgic bridge that I remember of 2000 to 2010 or whatever was, you know, a, a creature of its time, hmm. but, but definitely not original. Yeah. So, you know, we, we did what we needed to do to make it functional going forward into hmm. the future. And hopefully there'll be many generations that pass before we have to do that again. <laughs> Well, it, yeah, it's been nice to see it open up again. Yeah, and uh, definitely a lot of traffic on it. People are out enjoying it, and this new hope for Bridge Street. I think, uh, it, yeah, it'll it'll remain central in the life of the town, which is great. Um, let's see some other. Yeah, tell me about waterworks. Uh, ah, the waterworks. <laughs> Somehow my my uh, book just opened to that page immediately. <laughs> that was another one where the there was a certain level in which there was the same five things that were always said about it, mm -hmm. but it was a struggle to find what was the sixth and seventh thing that had never been said. Yeah. Um, and the, it wasn't until very late in the, the process, actually, that um, uh, I found a a very useful article that was, it was in another one of those, it's not exactly a trade publication, but a, a publication for uh, commissioners of waterworks or something like that, that had a very nice um, informative article by one of our locals, uh, William Markham, Markham Sleeper, who was the first chairman of the water commission. Mm -hmm. And he cleared up and, uh, a lot of the mysteries and, you know, it's just not been referred to ever since then yeah. <laughs> as there's, no one knows when, when this was built or, or what. And he sort of lays out that there was a, uh, an attempt at a commercial company, the, the Bell Water Company, that uh, initially was on the site, but it was a temporary structure. Mm. And really, other than occupying the same same site, not even necessarily the same footprint, did not have much to do with the building that uh, ended up, um, um, you know, being completely replaced in 1904 by the city of Waco. Mm -hmm. So that this is not, doesn't have anything to do with J.D. Bell's uh, waterworks, but um, it uh, um, uh, is in fact a pretty uh, impressive building, although you know, once again, you know, we see Waco buildings passing through time and strange things happen to them, like the uh, railroad caboose that's sticking out of. Uh, I assume that was a crash uh, and crush. Sort of <laughs> yes, I, I guess that might have been the illusion that yeah. was uh, going on there. I think I've only been in the building once uh, when it was a, a restaurant, but it seems that many people do remember when it was a restaurant or a, a bar. 
And in fact, the uh, one of the artifacts of that phase of the water pumping station is that um, on many a night, uh, drunk young men had to take it outside if they were going to fight each other and went across the street to East Terrace, which was distressing to the board <laughs> of the historic Waco Foundation because we don't want young men fighting on our ground. <laughs> and so that's the reason that there is that fence around East Terrace. It is nothing that had anything to do with the Mann family. It's an artifact of the, the restaurant bar that was across the street uh, in, in recent uh, times. That's really a challenge beca uh, because, you know, uh, again, you know, the, the landscaping of East Terrace, you know, we're basically missing the terraces, but it did terrace down to the river and the, the, the modern road uh, that runs right by that um, completely obliterates the relationship of the house to the, to the river. Yeah. So, yeah. oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, uh, who knows what uh, the, the Wake of Water pumping station might become next. Someone with deep pockets needs to do something about that. Uh, I've always thought our city hall is, is fascinating, just uh, the way the work in it, the, the hope to get a local uh, company to do the work, and it became political, I know. But, t mm -hmm. but tell a little bit of that story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's it, the, the, the whole thing is, is, is interesting, dating back well before this uh, building because mm -hmm. of the fact that uh, in Waco, the center of the town square is occupied by the city hall rather than the courthouse. Yeah. And the courthouse was, was shunted off to, uh, to, to one side. Mm -hmm. It actually was where the parking lot of the Hilton Hotel was mm -hmm. um, at uh, 2nd and Franklin. Um, so, the, so there was a, a, a very nice Victorian uh, courthouse um, uh, there, but I don't know to what degree the, uh, the 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 lynching of Jesse Washington had anything to do with with a feeling that we needed to move on mm -hmm. and have a new uh, courthouse because that had happened just out of the the northeast corner of the the courthouse square. Well, uh, that that lynching was with the new courthouse. I mean, the current courthouse is where that trial occurred. Jesse the, Washington yeah, the did. trial occurred, and but the, the, the city county hall courthouse. was uh, the the desire for a new city hall could have been connected to that. Yeah. yeah well, the 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 trial occurred at the courthouse, and then he was taken to the the, the town square to be lynched. Yeah, right out and right outside city hall. So, yeah, yeah. So uh, so it's interesting the the. the the courthouse uh, doesn't seem to be quite as implicated, mm -hmm. but it's kind of interesting to, to look at the, the city hall as, you know, sort of the art deco or yeah. art, art modern style. And, you know, it's of its own generation, kind of a let's move past, you know, the, this old fashioned Victorian, let's have something bold and modern. And, mm -hmm. and um, it's actually, um, an early, I, I was surprised that it was built as early as it was in 1929-30. I've looked at that many times and thought, you know, it looks like what's sometimes referred to as stripped classicism or a classicism that's simplified because of the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, this was designed just before the Depression. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so really it's a, a, an early uh, early example of, of this, which is intriguing. And the architect was someone who uh, was local, local in the sense that I guess he was, had been there about the same amount of time I have uh, been in Waco. But Harry L. Spicer um, uh, came to uh, Waco and was, was both an architect and a structural engineer and ended up working on uh, quite a few uh, uh, well-known Waco buildings. He was a structural engineer uh, for uh, Waco Hall on the Baylor mm -hmm. campus. Uh, he designed the, uh, um, the, the First National Bank, not the First National Bank, the City National Bank that's uh, on Fifth Avenue, the, the uh, Austin Avenue, the 500 mm -hmm. uh, block. The, uh, uh, the Stratton Furniture Store yeah. is his. So there's a whole series. So this is, the, really, this is the first time, this book is the first time that anyone's discussed his work as a coherent whole. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm trying to, to make the connections from 
entry to entry of other buildings that, that each architect has uh, has done. So um, Spicer was someone who was, you know, he was sort of the successor to Milton Scott of being the practical businessman as architect. Yeah, that he was very keen to make sure that that a building was presentable. Um, what the client was hoping for and not over budget. Yeah. And sometimes architects can dream a little too big <laughs> and can end up uh, uh, being challenged there. But Spicer was, was very much the businessman's architect. Um, the, a couple other buildings that are federal buildings that um, I think uh, people don't necessarily know as much of the history of that you've included here and done good service in doing it is the is the VA hospital, the Veterans Administration Hospital, and the uh, federal building, mm -hmm. or the court. I'm sorry, the U.S. courthouse, which is yes. the post office uh, at one point. But uh, if you can talk about a little bit about those buildings, yeah, yeah. The Waco Veterans Administration Hospital, which is now the Doris Miller mm -hmm. uh, Medical Center, is an interesting story. This is another one where. Um, just eyeballing it, I misdated it, mm -hmm. um, much like the city hall where, you know, it looked to be 1939 when it was actually 1929. And uh, I always looked at the, the VA hospital complex, which is, you know, this, this beautiful arrangement of, of buildings with red tile roofs and the, the like, and thought, oh, well, this is obviously something this New Deal. It's Franklin Roosevelt, mm -hmm. the, the New Deal coming in and trying to spend us out of the Great Depression. <coughs> actually... This complex was started during the administration of Herbert Hoover, mm -hmm. who um, was very concerned by the number of uh, veterans coming back from World War I with um, shell shock, which mm -hmm. was the, the period term for uh, post-traumatic stress. So he uh, uh, initiated a, a campaign of construction of veterans' hospitals throughout the United States all of them designed in Washington, D.C., and hopefully with some sort of style that was appropriate for the, the, the region where it was, uh, was serving. Um, and it was, in fact, the beneficiary of spending under the, the New Deal, but mm. that was some of the later buildings uh, behind it that kept building in the original style. Yeah. So it's an, a complex that has a very consistent style to it and is really quite a pleasure to walk around mm -hmm. it. And I really had, had never gotten around to doing it until it was like, well, I better write something for this <laughs> this chapter and was blown away just, just walking around and, and you know examining the, the different buildings. I This is probably a case where it would have been very easy to have 10 or 12 photographs of the, the various oh, yeah. buildings because they're they're quite nice. It's also significant in that it was the, the first National Register of Historic Places, Historic District in the city of Waco. Oh, wow. And, you know, uh, it predated the, the downtown Waco district or mm -hmm. the Castle Heights district. And the reason for that is uh, specifically because when George... H. W. Bush became president in 1989. One of his uh, signature initiatives was to raise uh, the Veterans Administration to the uh, a cabinet level position mm -hmm. as the Department of Veteran Affairs. And once that was accomplished, one of the first uh, things that the the VA did was to initiate a comprehensive survey of the historic significance of the old VA hospitals. Mm -hmm. And so out of that, basically, you know, this was something that, that came not from the local saying, gee whiz, we need to, I, you know, recognize that complex for what it is, but it was actually the George H.W. Bush administration doing that as part of a, a comprehensive policy at the national level. Wow. And there'll actually be a couple of, of uh, of images of the complex in more historic homes because uh, among the, the preserved buildings there are the chief medical officer's house, duplex, two duplexes for the medical officers and the nurses uh, building, uh, all, all there and in a pretty, pretty good state of, of repair. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a public building uh, and it's also folks' residences. 
Yeah, and they've they've had steady funds to uh, keep them up. I mean, yeah, and the grounds are beautiful. Yeah, so it's really a neat, really a neat location. Yeah. yeah, hopefully that will continue. Yeah, uh, the U.S. Courthouse, which is a oh yeah, yeah, building on Franklin, uh, right beside Union Hall. If you, if you you may drive kind of sandwiched between Union Hall and the old Waco Trib new mm-hmm. Magnolia Headquarter building. Yeah. Right, and that was one where. I was really kind of mystified uh, about the architect of that building mm-hmm. because as is the case with most most buildings from the, the, the 20s and 30s that are federal courthouses alike, um, it almost always gives the architect as the supervising architect of the treasury, <laughs> uh, which is Louis A. Simon in this case. And you, every post office in the United States from this era you go to his name is on the, the cornerstone. <laughs> and, yeah, it was busy. Yeah, and and of course he wasn't doing any. Of, I mean, he was you know managing this, yeah. the very large office, and there's a ton of architects in the office who were turning out courthouses and post offices and veterans administrations, hospitals, and and all of that sort of stuff. Well, in doing the research for this volume, I came across an uh, an interview with the architect of the building who was a guy named W.H. Schimmelfenig, hmm. and, which is a mouthful to, yeah. uh, to say. you practiced um, that. And, uh, well, having written about German Texans, I got mighty, uh, mighty used to it. But um, the, uh, he was actually from Texas, but not from the Waco area, hmm. but, but ended up becoming an architect. And the challenge for a building like this in the, the, the Great Depression is, you know, uh, uh, once again, the need to have it stylish and presentable, but not breaking the bank. And I think this really tests the limit of how little you can spend to make it <laughs> uh, uh, not break the bank. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the style giving elements here tend to be focused on the main door and the window immediately above it. They're projecting pavilions at each corner, which are very simple. And there's a, a, a prominent window at the base of each of those. The row of, uh, of, of tiles uh, as well. It's not really clear if you really looking at it from most sides that the, the building is in fact U-shaped, which mm-hmm. was to uh, encourage uh, natural ventilation. This was at a point where where you know, very few buildings had air conditioning in them. And so it was Mm -hmm. still, you know, very much the ceiling fan and, and, you know, that, that's, that's about it. The other thing that had never really been clear to me was the, the importance of the location for the post office, Mm -hmm. because this is on Franklin, as you were mentioning, Mm -hmm. and it backs up to Mary. So once again, the railroad tracks were right there. And so the, for the post office, you wanted that, 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 easy connection to the railroad, which could get letters delivered to you more quickly mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, your letters uh, out of town delivered more quickly as well. So the post office was actually the back part of the building. It's, it's, it's been somewhat obscured even further by the fact that there's a, an addition that was placed on it at a later date, but, but done in a, a, a compatible style, let's put it that way. Mm. Yeah, it's an interesting building that that yeah. uh, I would think most people wouldn't know what it is. So, uh, well, let's jump ahead to education. Sure. So I wondered if there was going to be a buildings of Baylor, but you've already uh, <laughs> you've already shot that uh, with your inclusions of several uh, his- historic. Stru- you stayed on the quad, uh, but you, that kind of core historic core of of uh, Baylor University, Old Main Burleson, Carroll Science, and, mm-hmm. and Carroll Library. Uh, I'm interested in, in maybe just some insights and in looking into them this time and uh, what what you learned about those structures. Yeah, well, I think that, that I saw this as my opportunity to say what I had to say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> about Baylor without doing a book that would be dedicated to the entirety of the campus. Sure. Um, And part of that is because, you know, in the modern era, there was a tendency to build things that, that rejected the, the earlier Baylor buildings and, and um, 
uh, just just do something completely different, which sometimes did not turn out well. Um, but over and above that, I'm a historian, not an architecture critic. Yeah. <laughs> and so when when you sort of move it out of its historic context, it's not as um, suggestive to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm I'm my my goal here is not necessarily to tell people what's the most beautiful buildings in Waco. Sure. It's it is quite explicitly historic buildings in Waco. And the 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 notion of well what makes it historic, you know, there there are certain things that that a building from, you know, whenever the 1880s is going to have um, that other other times will not. The um, those those sort of issues interest me more than saying why a, a building is aesthetically successful mm-hmm. or not. Mm-hmm. So um, in terms of the the campus, um, it's sort of a, a coming out party part two for Birch Easterwood. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who yeah. was uh, you know made a huge impact on Waco houses, mm-hmm. and so Historic Homes of Waco was was the first time he'd ever been looked at in any sort of comprehensive manner. And it turns out that he had become very uh, integrated with the uh, the Baylor administration starting in the 1920s. So all of the buildings from the 20s and 30s have his stamp upon it, although they end up being different. Um, there, there, there were some some funding issues, uh, like for Women's Memorial Dorm. There, there was a great deal of alumni fundraising that 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 shifted. Uh, shifted that. So Birch Easterwood Part Two is the way in which um, uh, he and President Brooks worked closely together, mm-hmm. starting with the old Brooks Hall, but uh, going all the way up to Pat Neff Hall, which is you know one of the iconic buildings of Waco. Yeah, and um, that that um, th- was is certainly one of the most important buildings in Easterwood's career, uh, though he did come back to give the university what they wanted on uh, Tidwell Bible Building, which there's a, a whole long story with regard to that, which resulted in the firing of the original architect. And they knew that Easterwood would deliver a building that was presentable and on budget. Mm-hmm. And so so he, he, and by this time, his son, Kenneth Easterwood, came back for one, one last uh, hurrah at Baylor. I found myself... In uh, terms of the, the, the earlier Baylor buildings, being very interested in uh, Carroll Science and Carroll Library, which mm-hmm. is the, the phase two buildings. You have Old Main and Georgia Burleson as phase one. And then you get uh, really just a matter of 13, 14 years later, the next generation of buildings and moving from the Victorian into the neoclassical. And... Um, the, the thing that was so striking about that, uh, I've, this is another one where I've just always wondered, no, no one ever says who the architects were or whatever. And it turns out that the architects were Wesser, uh, Messer and Smith of hmm. Fort Worth. And of course, the next question becomes, who the heck are Messer and Smith, were, uh, Smith of Fort Worth? And it turns out that they were both English emigre architects who came from England to Cowtown and hung out their shingle as architects. And Howard, Howard Messer and uh, S. Wemeth, Wemeth Smith uh, had a partnership for just a while. And so this, these are very uh, good examples of the work that they did. S. S. Wemeth Smith ended up moving to Oklahoma City and became one of the architects for the Oklahoma State Capitol. Oh, wow. So that becomes his most famous uh, building. But uh, it was interesting uh, finding the that there was the use on uh, uh, Carroll Science and Carroll Library of uh, Luder's Stone. And once mm-hmm. again, that was a, those were quarries uh, out in Jones County, north of Abilene, yeah. that, that those hadn't existed, and the, the the combination of the train tie-in and the opening of that quarry allowed ba- Baylor to use that for the base on both of the buildings, and then uh, a, a modern pressed brick from St. Louis for the upper stories. 
And so they're very much buildings of their time mm-hmm. and incorporating, you know, these new materials uh, and, and incorporating the new neoclassical style. Okay, I decided as we talked, we're going to do <laughs> buildings of Baylor uh, <laughs> sometime because I want to make sure we get attention to some of these other buildings. And one that I think is a really interesting building in the moment because of dreams about his future is William Decker Johnson mm-hmm. Hall, uh, mm-hmm. which I, was really a landmark building when it was built for yes. Paul Quinn campus, a very modern building built in the 20s, I believe, yeah, mm-hmm. early 20s. So, so some of you know it as that building with it's boarded up, uh, kind of uh, sitting on Garrison uh, Street, mm-hmm. uh, right outside the uh, the multipurpose center there uh, in East Waco. But tell us a little bit about why William Decker Johnson Hall is significant. Yeah, well, it's actually. I'm going to have to calculate here, but I'm thinking, well, it's the second oldest building that remains from the Paul Quinn campus. Yeah. And that had been Waco's, um, historically, one of Waco's two historically black colleges. There was one over in North Waco as well, um, which was associated with with the, the Baptist congregations. And then Paul Quinn College was associated with the Methodist Episcopal, African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, and... I actually enjoyed doing research on Paul Quinn Mm -hmm. uh, because it was another one where you hear the same five things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you move beyond uh, what were the earlier buildings, how did they relate? And so that that was that was something that I found rewarding to see the sort of energy and determination that the the uh, the folks who uh, built Paul Quinn College had. And one of the most visionary things happened in the early 1920s when they uh, uh, de- decided to hire William Sidney Pittman of mm-hmm. Dallas. And uh, he's not necessarily a, uh, a, a, a brand name figure in our sort of modern public consciousness, but for Texas architectural historians, he's known as the first professional black architect. And... Uh, a very important fi- uh, figure in the the state, and he one of his churches still stands in um, uh, Waxahachie, mm-hmm. and um, uh, others in in Houston buildings in, in Dallas as well. So it was kind of a, a a get for the Paul Quinn administration to be able to yeah. uh, convince him to come and work on the building. I was very excited when when uh, when when I came across the evidence of his doing work for Paul Quinn. Um, is one of those things where um, the, the 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 connection became much better documented because we now have digitized a lot of historically black newspapers mm-hmm. and the, the the newspaper from Dallas which is escaping my is that the, uh, yeah yeah the, the, I know the I know the newspaper you're talking about yeah I guess we could cheat and look in the <laughs> yeah the the I, I I will mention that that there there's not a footnote anywhere to be seen in the text of the book but you can actually flip and find out that um, examiner the Dallas Express, Dallas Express very frequently provided information uh, about uh, William Sidney Pittman and in fact uh, it was interesting because uh, in terms of, of these projects uh, it would the, the ad in the Dallas Express would say you can see a copy of the plans in Waco uh, at the college or at Mr. Pittman's office uh, here in Dallas, and he was in that area that's um, um, uh, now referred to as Deep Ellum. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the the prominent multi-story building that's now a, a trendy hotel was designed by him, mm. uh, which has has been left forlorn for long. So uh, I I hope that it's it's been sufficiently respectful of of, of what what he did. Um, so yeah, the 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 building. Is you know somewhat like uh, uh, Henry L. Spicer among white architects. Uh, William Sidney Pittman is looking to give the biggest bang for the buck yeah. to his clients, 
both in terms of having a building that was spacious and structurally sound, um, but but also you know with enough ornamentation to dignify it uh, as as being uh, an important building. And so in that regard, you you, you get the 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 nice front porch here with the pairs of of uh, of steps and the, the 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 shady porch that's there. Mm. I guess I should mention that William Sidney Pittman uh, had uh, gone to the uh, uh, Tuskegee Institute in uh, Alabama and uh, ended up uh, working at Tuskegee with Robert R. Taylor, who designed the Tuskegee campus and is is very well known as a pioneering black architect in America. Uh, he, in fact, was the first black man to graduate from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's um, uh, School of Architecture. Okay. So, so yeah, so there, there's a sense in which his, his connection with Tuskegee is more than just sort of a gee whiz. It speaks to uh, what he, uh, uh, how he came to have the training and skill that, uh, uh, that he had. Uh, he also ended up marrying Portia Washington, who was the, the daughter of Booker T. Washington. So I think in, in black society in Texas mm -hmm. and in, in, in Dallas in particular, you know, they were probably like this, you know, royal couple that, that they were, uh, you know, um, you know, esteemed for his professional skill and, and esteemed for her uh, background as the daughter of the founder of uh, an important historically black college. Mm -hmm. So so an interesting story. I think it, it, it does have somewhat of a sad end, ending in that I think um, Pittman ended up being very frustrated that that the, the commissions that he got tended to be small and low budget just out of the nature of you know the, 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 the low budget that an, uh, a historically black college could uh, provide. I mean, they were struggling against, you know, racism mm -hmm. in the 1920s as they had from from long before, and he ended up turning to drink as yeah. a lot, which I think is is really sort of, you know, you know, his solace yeah. uh, in in whatever degree it can actually bring solace. But it also ended up breaking up his marriage because yeah. uh, Portia ended up uh, moving back to, to to Alabama and William Sidney Pittman. Uh, stayed here, but he became less less productive. But I think this is an excellent example of uh, of his work, and I'm glad that it's been identified by people other than me. Sometimes I get nervous uh, going out on a limb here. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in in terms of reading through the, the the Dallas Express and other newspapers, there there were a number of, of mentions of building projects at Paul Quinn and matching that one up to the one that's specifically designed by Pittman is a bit bit of a challenge, mm. but um, it certainly fits within the, the parameters of what he was doing in the 1920s. I see. Okay. Well, let, let's jump ahead to Chapter 7. What's Chapter 7? Chapter 7 is the Masonic Buildings oh and Museums of Waco. Yes. And uh, I think because of Waco's central location, we were well positioned to... Uh, have the brotherhoods uh, around. Uh, it, it certainly seems that way. I, I think, too, that there was a very aggressive move mm -hmm. on the part of our locals. Uh, uh, Ed Rotan was, uh, was one of the leaders of the, the move from Waco, uh, from Houston to Waco. And yeah. Houston had been the the, the home of the Masonic uh, Lodge from its founding, uh, way back whenever that was the, uh, I don't know if that was 1830s or 40s, but but yeah, it's a little it's a little strange and confusing. Uh, I I uh, hopping to the uh, the Grand Masonic Lodge yeah. of 1947-49. One of the confusing things about it is that the uh, out front, it incorporates the cornerstone of the previous Grand Masonic Lodge <laughs> yeah. in Waco. And it was like, what the heck is this doing here? But it was, I, I appreciated it ultimately in terms of providing the backstory, but nobody knows it's the backstory. <laughs> you know, you're looking at this monumental sort uh -huh. of late art deco building and it's like, where? why is there a cornerstone from... Uh, 
you know, 1904, which uh -huh. is when the lodge moved. And that was actually originally on Franklin uh, Avenue. I guess it was around Franklin and six, South 6th Street. Hmm. And uh, actually a rather interesting uh, building. Uh, so, and that, that sort of explains why that was a, a big time for Ed Rotem being a, a community leader here in, in Waco. So they, they were able to make that. And, and, you know, I think it reflects that Texas was growing so much and, you know, uh, Waco had gone from being a frontier outpost to being something that was really centrally located mm -hmm. with, with so many new communities uh, growing up to the, to the, to the west of us. And, um, so it was interesting uh, looking at that in the, the context of uh, the, the, the architects who were uh, involved. They, they actually, for the current building, brought in Broad and Nelson of Dallas. And they, they were a pretty well-known uh, firm, especially on commercial buildings. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, uh, Donald Nelson was actually uh, an MIT graduate um, and was uh, also a Mason himself. Hmm. So that he did the Masonic Temple in Dallas as well, okay. the one in El Paso. And so so that's the other thing that, that you know, I enjoy in these volumes is, is thinking about the connections of other buildings in Texas uh, or, uh, or elsewhere. So, so it was interesting looking at this in terms of the Masonic symbolism that was incorporated, the, the two piers, those columns that are out front. One's a terrestrial globe and the other is a celestial globe, mm -hmm. a, a globe rep representing the, the patterns of, of the, the stars and the constellation and things like that, that, that the, the Masonic order was very uh, keen to uh, 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 to incorporate into mm -hmm. their their buildings but mm -hmm. but a pretty pretty impressive uh impressive structure but even the the local masonic lodge the one that's at uh, washington avenue and eighth uh i've always thought it was a very uh nice uh structure and a, a one that's that's uh definitely by milton w scott the, mm -hmm. the local uh waco architect um and so the the it's one of the things that I found interesting there was that, you know, most of the, the Masonic buildings are on what would be considered the piano nobile, the, the floor of nobility. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that as, as in ancient uh, Italy, you know, commercial on the first floor, on the ground floor, and then the true first floor and other things were above that. So just to find out that there was something called the New Temple Drugstore that was the anchor <laughs> for this. <laughs> Uh, uh, was something, something. So the new Temple Drugstore was down on the first floor. Yeah, I yeah. assume it was that yeah. corner space yeah. on on the the, the ground floor, mm -hmm. um, and there was also a, a grocery store and a flower shop. So oh, wow. so there there was a lot of, you know, that's the way in which a building becomes part of the the the, the network of the of the community and not just uh, not just a single. Um, single function and in fact uh, i believe the proprietor and owner of the new temple drugstore his house will be in more historic homes of Waco, Texas. okay all right there's <laughs> so a stay good, tuned there's a good tease there uh, i think the grand Karam shrine building is representative of maybe some of these orders the challenges in holding on to uh, some of these very large uh, expensive to maintain buildings yeah, um, yeah waco had so many <laughs> interesting buildings uh um in the Masonic orders, and and yeah, it, they they it's it's I don't know if you want to say overbuilt, but mm -hmm. mm, overbuilt. Um, uh, in the case of the the the, the Grand Karam Shrine Building, they actually uh, made a conscious decision to move out of the downtown area. Yeah. That goes back to the era of uh, urban renewal and suburbanization, and so uh, their their little building, I believe, is off Cobb's, sort of sort of near New uh, New Road, um, and it, it's kind of interesting, you know, just making the comparison of, of the the old and the 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 new. The interesting thing here for me was that no one had identified this building as being by Herbert M. Green, mm -hmm. who was another Dallas architect. I believe he was another. Uh, Mason, 
But uh, he was a prominent Dallas architect in the, the 20s, and this is a building in 1927, 28. But um, his uh, firm was also uh, very much involved in the design of the University of Texas campus. Mm. Um, the, uh, he, he was named the university architect, which um, he was supposed to be following a master plan there. But uh, Garrison Hall, where I spent many, many a day in, when I was in graduate school in American studies at UT, but uh, Wagoner and biology and chemistry and chemistry gym were all designed by him. But here in Waco, you know, uh, he's he's involved on the Masonic front rather than uh, well on the university front. Mm -hmm. And we know the completion date of that building because it's very soon Hotel 1928 will <laughs> yes. will open up. I'm uh, pleased that they got the date right. Yeah, they did. <laughs> get, they did get the date right. Well, uh, Ken, I don't want to give everything away in the book, and we've covered a lot of ground, but I I, I want you to step back. A little bit, not not physically. You don't have to step back because no one can see you if you do it. But I'm interested in kind of, you know, as you take it as a whole and you think about this landscape of commercial structures that and educational structures, I mean, all these public buildings really is, is what they all are. Um, I mean, how, should, how is Waco maybe... What are some characteristics of that landscape of public structures? I mean, what, I mean, what, what do you? What are some conclusions? Maybe some broader things that you draw mm -hmm. from this examination. You don't write a conclusion. I'm, I'm getting, I know. I'm asking you to make a conclusion. Really, you yeah. ask hard questions, yeah. Stephen Sloan. Yeah. <laughs> it's. I mean, my the the objective in doing this was well. Uh, objective number one, as with historic homes was to emphasize that there there is a lot of interesting and significant uh, historic buildings that remain in Waco. You know, one of the le legends that even today you can hear is, you know, oh, all the old stuff was demolished by the, the tornado in mm -hmm. 1953. Yeah. So that, 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 I mean, that, so that's kind of a simple statement, but hey, there's a whole lot of historic things yeah. here. Um, uh, I'm also very keen to emphasize that history moves on. Yeah. That, you know, the the notion for the, for the folks who uh, were the founders of the historic Waco Foundation, as it used to be called back in the day, mm -hmm. um, I think they would probably be horrified to see some of the the newer buildings in here. That's not historic. Yeah. Historic building is back in the day, pre-industrial or what whatever. That, that you know, there's a tremendous nostalgia for. Um, a certain way of life that seemed more attractive to them. So I've, I've tried very hard to move away from that old historical understanding and to continue continue the story well uh, well into the 20th century and getting close to the the present day, but still still with enough time to give some historical distance. My, but to, to get to the, the, the core of the hard question that you asked, mm -hmm. um, my, f my feeling is that the, the, what I have found is that Waco went through so many of the same fashion phases and historical phases as the rest of Texas, as the rest of the South, in, in a lot of cases in the rest, in the rest of the nation, um, that, that, you know, it, it is very much an American story. Mm -hmm. And um, I think at, while saying that, it's also important to say that there are certain things that do not happen in Waco. It's, it's almost as yeah. if the absences are more prominent than, you know, individual distinctions of the buildings that exist. And I'm thinking about that, you know, one, one thing that, that sort of creeps in at the very end of historic homes 
is the fact that that Wacoans were profoundly uninterested in modernism, mm -hmm. and that that could, would mean even either the sort of avant-garde modernism of the Bauhaus and the international style, mm -hmm. or of the the sort of more friendly to the average viewer art deco style, which had more raz razzle dazzle and razzmatazz to yeah. it, and. That just never really took off <laughs> in Waco. So it's interesting uh, interesting seeing that. And I don't know if that speaks to uh, uh, sobriety in a Waco way of thinking about how our buildings should present us mm -hmm. to the rest of the world. Or if the, they're, and it, may, it may be modernity as opposed to tradition that, that you know, Waco having, you know, set its roots down uh, at a point, you know, when there was, you know, very traditional classical buildings. And so you get Earl Harrison House or um, the, the Fort House yeah. or, or the like. Um, that had a very strong pull for mm -hmm. the people who were the, the founders of of uh, historic Waco and and other uh, other people, um, so so I I'm the mod the modernity came about actually less in modern buildings but in modern ways of arranging the city and you know the sort of flight to the suburbs and the mm -hmm. uh, uh, the the creating of a new main street uh, of, of valley mills and. Mm -hmm. And the 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 like, so that um, you know, I I think that that's something that undergirds a, a lot of this. That that you see, you know, the decisions that people are ma are making as to whether to whether to stay or whether to to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, the 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 building that's now uh, Seronia, mm -hmm. the the shop, yeah. was Saks Fifth Avenue, which was a women's clothing store, mm -hmm. but specifically there to get away from the congestion of the town square. Yeah. And, you know, to a generation that's used to, you know, hearing the 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 um, the, the urban renewal disc of downtown as being slummy and run down mm -hmm. and no one no one wants to go there. But uh, in the case of of uh, Saks Austin Avenue and also the 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 grocery store that was very near mm -hmm. that. They both moved there in the 50s specifically because the, the parking was difficult yeah, in, in the, the downtown area. Mm -hmm. so, so downtown was okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and they did not move that far out. It was not really a flight from the city mm -hmm. like you end up seeing in the 50s. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, and moving further out into new suburbs and the like. Mm -hmm. well, what I love about the book, I'll tell you what I like about the book. Yeah, is tell it, me. Tell is, me. It, is it really puts um, historic buildings in kind of the lived landscape of life in Waco mm -hmm. from where I eat to where I shop to where I might worship to where I may socialize. You know, it's all in here to think of those places as historic also, not these places behind velvet ropes mm -hmm. that have visiting hours, but to think about the historic landscape much more broadly than that, mm -hmm. I think is a big contribution uh, that the book makes. Well, thank you. And uh, I'm encouraged also to see some of these properties are being stewarded well, but there's also, if you look <laughs> in these pages, some great opportunities for someone to step up to the plate and make mm -hmm. sure these buildings are... Definitely. Uh, in your revised edition, you're going to come out within 10 years. <laughs> so, <yeah>. We shall <laughs> see. <laughs> well, Ken, I want to thank you again for coming on the podcast. And uh, I'll have you back yeah. at some point. We'll do a Buildings of Baylor. And then, of course, when we get more historic homes, we got to talk about those as well. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Yeah, I enjoyed it very much. Thanks for having Thanks, me. Thanks, Ken. make it by Thanks for listening to the Waco History Podcast. Like what you heard? Subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes so we can reach more listeners. You can find show notes and info on every episode at wacohistorypodcast.com and more info on Waco's past at wacohistory.org. 
Our theme music, used with permission, is Cross the Brazos at Waco, performed by the late Billy Walker. For more info on Billy's music, go to billywalker.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. This has been a Rogue Media Network production. Thank you.